Hello everyone! In this set of videos, we are going to wrap up our study of regression by taking a look at the omitted variable problem. In this video, we will discuss why the omitted variable problem is so important in regression analysis, and in the coming videos, we will talk about some solutions that we can use to mitigate the problem. Previously, we discussed the assumptions that need to be in place to establish causality in a regression model. We're now going to dig a little bit deeper into the second assumption. Specifically, we're going to get into detail on what can lead to that assumption being violated and why that violation is such a problem. To get us motivated, let's take a look at this graph. In this graph, we can see several data points through time, starting in 1820 all the way up to the year 2000. We can see that as the number of pirates in the world went down, the global average temperature went up. So what do we conclude from this graph? That pirates were preventing global warming? And the number of pirates decreasing caused the temperature to rise? Well, probably not, but today we're going to talk about exactly why that would be. Returning to our assumptions, remember that we needed the expectation of epsilon, the error term, to be zero, and also for the error term to be uncorrelated with all of our explanatory variables in the equation. That is, x1 is uncorrelated with epsilon, x2 is uncorrelated with epsilon, and so on. If that is not true, that is, any of our x's are correlated with epsilon, that is what we call an endogeneity problem. And that breaks our ability to establish causality in the model. This is a huge pervasive problem that we see all over the place in regression analysis. In regression analysis, our goal is so often to establish causality, and endogeneity prevents us from doing so. Ultimately, this is highly consequential in business because we need to have a causal interpretation to make a proper decision. To get us thinking about this, let's look at the data set sales data and run two different regressions. In this data set, I have sales, price, and average consumer income for a number of different markets served by a hypothetical company. Our company wants to estimate its demand function. So we're going to run a regression, go into data analysis, select regression, and for our dependent variable, we're going to pick sales. For our explanatory variable, we are going to pick price. As always, we're going to select labels and run the regression. We get an interesting result here, and that is a positive coefficient on price, meaning that this regression shows us as price goes up, the quantity demanded goes up. Immediately, we should see a red flag there. That does not make sense. Ultimately, the company wants to use this information to choose a price. And this looks like if they increase the price, they're going to sell more output, so they should just keep raising the price forever but we know that this is probably not causally valid. Of course, there are many other factors that influence the quantity demanded in a market, and if those are correlated with price, then that means we have endogeneity. Let's go back to the data and run another regression, this time adding in income. For the X range, I'm now going to select both price and income. Looking at the results, we see a huge difference. Now we have a negative coefficient estimate for the price, meaning that this model shows as price goes up, quantity demanded goes down, which is much more in line with what we would expect it to be. Let's talk about why this happened. Here I have a scatter plot of price and sales showing a positive relationship, just like we saw from our first regression. Of course, this is misleading. Correlation and causality are not the same thing. So while higher prices tend to be associated with higher sales, the higher sales are not necessarily because of the price. There could be something else going on. In this scatter plot on the left, I have price and income showing that higher prices tend to be associated with higher incomes. And on the right, we have a scatter plot of sales and income showing that higher incomes are associated with higher sales. Since the higher prices also tended to have high incomes, it looked like higher prices caused higher sales. 
but that was actually not the case. It was because of the income hiding out in the background that made it look like that, and therefore disrupting our ability to estimate a causal relationship between price and sales. But once we included income in the equation, we're therefore able to hold it constant and estimate that relationship that we're after. In our example, when we left income out, the effects of income moved into the error term. And since income and price were correlated, we now had correlation between our explanatory variable and the error term. That's going to violate our assumption resulting in endogeneity. When we have a variable that is hiding out in the error term that is also correlated with explanatory variable, we say that that is an omitted variable. It's a variable that really we should have in our equation, but it's not there. It was omitted. Whenever we have an omitted variable, when we run the regression, we are not actually properly estimating our coefficient, our beta. Instead, we're getting some tangled up combination of the actual beta, but also the effects of the omitted variable. But what we were trying to estimate is a causal relationship between our explanatory variable and the dependent variable, which we can't do anymore since it's mixed up with all this other stuff. I'll mention now that endogeneity, a correlation between explanatory variables and the error term, can result from other sources as well, one being measurement error. But we are going to be focusing on omitted variables. I mentioned already that omitted variables are going to cause our estimates to be off. This is what we call bias in statistics. Bias means that on average our estimates will be wrong. This, of course, is a big problem when we're trying to establish causality. Remember that the interpretation of our betas in a regression is the effect of each explanatory variable on the dependent variable while holding the other explanatory variables constant. But in order to hold them constant, those variables actually need to be in the equation. Anything left out is still in the error term. And therefore, if we change one of our explanatory variables, say, xj, anything that's in the error term is free to move around still. So when we attempt to measure the effects of changing xj, we're getting the direct effect of xj on y, that's what we're actually trying to measure, but if xj is correlated with one of those omitted variables, epsilon, the error term, is also going to change. And when epsilon changes, y changes as well. So our estimate for the coefficient, beta j, will capture both that direct effect that we want, but also part of the omitted variables effect. And when that all gets jumbled together, we're unable to actually estimate the direct effect anymore. Let's look at our example where we had sales equals beta naught plus beta one times price plus epsilon. We are trying to estimate beta one, the effect of increasing the price. When price increases, that has a direct effect on the sales, and probably a negative one. But when price is higher, income also tends to be higher. And income, remember, when we don't have it in the determining function, is out here influencing epsilon. So an increase in price is also going to increase income. And when income increases, sales increase. So our estimate for beta 1 is not just this part that we wanted, but also this part over here that we didn't want. The way that we solved that problem was by taking income out of the error term and putting it into our determining function. By pulling income out of the error term and putting it in the regression, we are essentially cutting off the possibility of this relationship. We are holding it constant. So when price goes up, income is now being held constant. So we were able to properly estimate beta 1 with income in the regression where we couldn't without it. Let's look at one more example. One of the most common regressions we see in empirical economics is the Mincer equation. The Mincer equation is wage as a function of education. This is a big open question. What is the effect of education on people's earnings? In this version of the equation, the variable educ is the years of education completed. 
We typically think that beta 1 is positive, but if we were to just run this regression, wage on education, our estimate for beta 1 would likely be biased. The reason for that is that there's all kinds of variables influencing wage, that is part of the error term, that are also correlated with education. And by just running this regression, we're going to get the effects of education tangled up with the effects of all those other omitted variables. To identify omitted variables, we need to think about which variables are not only influencing wage, but correlated with education, so that when education moves around, those other variables tend to move around, and then, in turn, influence the wage. Let's focus on one in particular, ability. Ability is definitely inside the error term, because high ability people tend to be better at their jobs and make more money. So clearly ability must be somewhere in that error term. But now let's think about the correlation between ability and education. High ability people tend to achieve higher levels of education. On average, people who go to college and complete college are higher ability, and people who attend and complete graduate school are even higher ability than that, on average anyway. So if we leave ability out of the regression and just regress wage on years of education, then our estimate is going to be biased because it's now absorbing some of that ability effect in there. So if we run that regression, we cannot claim that the estimate we get is causal. So we could see a big estimate for the effect of education, but since we don't have ability in the equation, it's entirely possible, now I don't think this is true, but it is possible that all we're seeing is the effect of ability and maybe education doesn't matter at all. The reality, of course, is probably somewhere in between. So we've established that in many regressions that you might run, we could end up with a biased estimate. But what can we do with these biased estimates? We can use this to predict whether we think that the true beta that we're trying to estimate will tend to be higher or lower than the estimate that we got. Let's return to the Mincer equation from a few minutes ago. Let's assume that the true DGP for the Mincer equation is wage equals beta naught plus beta 1 education plus beta 2 ability. We mentioned earlier that education and ability are related. Let's suppose that this relationship is described by the equation here, education equals delta naught plus delta 1 ability plus epsilon a. The deltas here are just the parameters in this equation, and I've chosen to use deltas just to make it clear that they're not the same as the betas, but they serve the same role in that equation. And I've also put the subscript a on epsilon here to indicate that this epsilon is different from the one in the first equation, but it serves the same role in determining education as epsilon does in determining wage. It's the error term in the education equation. So we can see here there's a direct relationship between ability and education, which is delta 1. Let's say that we cannot get any data on ability, so we're forced to leave it out of the regression and simply regress wage on education. Not ideal, but we're stuck with that. We know, because of the relationship between education and ability, our estimate is biased. But we can think a little bit more carefully about the direction in which it is biased. There are two steps to this. First, we are going to make some conjecture about the sign of delta 1. What is the effect of ability on education? Remember that we do not have data on ability, so this is all hypothetical. But we can think through this logically, and we've already discussed the fact that generally, higher ability people will be more likely to not only be accepted into and complete college. That's not to say that there are high ability people who don't go to college, or low ability people who do, but on average, this will be the case. So we could conclude that most likely delta 1 is positive. Higher ability on average means higher education. The second step is now to think about what is the sign of beta 2? Had we been able to put ability into the original regression equation, what would the sign be? What is ability's effect on wage? Again, since we don't have ability, we can't actually estimate this, but we can think through it logically. Generally, people who are high ability are better at their jobs, they are more competitive for promotions, so this generally, on average, leads to higher pay. Again, not necessarily going to be the case every time, but on average, this will be true, so beta 2 is also positive. Once we've figured out what the likely sign of those two parameters are, then we can figure out the sign of the bias. The sign of the bias is going to be the product of the signs of those two parameters. Since we think that beta 2 and delta 1 are both positive, positive times a positive will be a positive bias. 
Positive bias means that on average, our estimate will be too high. So we will, most of the time at least, overestimate the effect of education on wage. Let's illustrate this briefly. Education has an effect on wage, probably positive, but education also has a relationship with ability. When education is higher, ability tends to be higher, so there's a positive relationship here. This is delta 1, and when ability goes up, wage also goes up, so we have a positive relationship here. This is beta 2. So when we try to estimate the effect of increasing education, ability goes up, and then because of that, wage also goes up, so we are getting not only beta 1, but we're getting this other effect that is positive. So we are going to overestimate the effect of education. This is just one example of the sign that we will get for the bias. Depending on the signs of delta 1 and beta 2, the relationship between the explanatory variable and the omitted variable, and then the relationship between the omitted variable and the dependent variable, we can get four combinations. Both positive, we get positive bias, that's what we just got, but both negative will also give us a positive bias, and if the signs are mixed, positive and negative, negative and positive, we're going to end up with a negative bias. And a negative bias means that on average we're going to underestimate the effect of our explanatory variable on the dependent variable. Now why do we care about signing the bias? Being able to identify the fact that our estimate is biased is already a good step. Later on we're going to talk about some solutions to bias, but let's suppose that you could not get rid of the bias, and you know that. You might still be able to make a recommendation off of your biased estimate. Of course there will be some caveats to that. But let's suppose that you were asked for a recommendation about increasing advertisement spending. So you get some data on sales and ad spending, run the regression. You sit down and think, well, I have a positive estimate for beta 1, but I think there are some omitted variables here, and I think that we've got some bias. But if we think that our bias is negative and that we have underestimated it, then that still tells us that we definitely can increase sales by increasing ad spending. And so you might still be able to make some recommendation of even though my estimate was biased, I still think that ad spending was effective. Now, if you thought your bias was positive, you overestimated, then you might say, well, let's be careful about increasing our ad spending. Now, we do have to be careful about this because if we know that our estimate is biased, then it's important to say, well, we don't know exactly what the effect is going to be. We are pretty sure it's positive, or we're pretty sure it's negative, but because you have not accurately made an estimate, you don't know how far you're off, we don't have the data on that, you can't make a precise estimate anymore. I want to wrap up here by saying that everything that we've done in signing the bias, we did without data. We did not have data on ability, but we were able to think through it logically. This is an example of why the human element in regression is so important. Running the regressions is only half of it. You still have to be able to think critically about what's going on. This is why I generally advise against hard and fast rules when it comes to regression, because there really aren't any. You have to be able to think through the interpretation. In general, it always helps to have what in regression analysis we call the story to explain the relationship between two variables. When you're presenting your results, it's usually not enough to just say it's positive or it's negative. You want to be able to tell your audience why you think that's happening.